We know a hundred different ways to cook an egg. Hello. Hello. Guten Tag. Hello. Здравствуйте. We have 323 different ways to say hello. We find thousands of ways to text, chat, tweet, snap and swipe. So why would we choose only one way to know God? You ever been in a relationship with somebody, but you can't remember their name? And like at work, I don't mean like that kind of, I mean like at work kind of a deal. And <laughs> it did sound awful, sorry. Um, <laughs> I mean, at work, like, you, you know somebody, but, and you, but it's too long. Like, you know them, and you have this assumed familiarity, and you're way past the point of no return where it's too embarrassing to tell them you don't know their name because you talk a lot, and you, you, know, you interact, and it's just, oh, you don't want to do it. And I was at a, like a church function not long ago, and I was, Ashley was with me, and I was introducing her to everybody, and I came to one guy, and I didn't introduce her to him. And she said, why didn't you introduce me to that guy? And I said, I, I can't think of his name. And she said, well, how long is he, is he new? And I said, no. I said, how long has he been at the church? I'm like, three years. You know, he's been here forever. And she goes, what do you, you, you know him, but you don't know his name? Why don't you just go ask him his name? I said, I can't. Like, I, I interact with the guy every day, but my brain literally, I just like tuned it out. I could not think of his name. And you feel like I know you too well, but I really don't know you that well. But I pretend like I know you well, and therefore I'm too embarrassed to ask you and reintroduce myself. To you. And so you give him like a nickname, right? You see him in the hallway, and you're, you, all right, right? You know? <laughs> and so, big time, what's up? What's up? You know? And they're like, oh, he knows me, but you have no idea. Um, I think we do this, I think we do this with the Bible a lot. And we have this assumed familiarity with the Bible, and we kind of act like we know it, and it's important to us because we told everybody it's important to us, but we really don't know it. And we don't spend a lot of time with it, but we're too embarrassed because of our assumed familiarity. We're way too embarrassed to profess that and to say, you know what, I, I'm just, I've pretended like I knew the Bible for so long, now I can't possibly admit that I don't know a whole lot about it. And so I'm not going to reintroduce myself and engage with it. And we just kind of leave it there. And we think the Bible is important, and we talk about it, and we give it to third graders, and we give it to our kids, and we have them in our house, and we give them as gifts, and we don't really know it. And I'm not trying to shame you at all, and I'm in the same boat with you, but what I do want to do today is try to ignite in you an interest to read your Bible as one of the real important lenses through which we look to see and find and to know God. Studies show about 88% of Americans, that's a lot of people, have a Bible in their house. In fact, most households, if you go home today, I'd guess you have about four and a half. That's what studies would show. You've got four and a half Bibles laying around, um, about 82% think it's sacred, the divine inspired word of God, and about no percent read it very often, right? Not no percent, and if you're here today and you read it every day, then you're kind of off the hook for the next 27 minutes. But for those of you that are like me sometimes, now I spend a lot of time in the scripture preparing for sermons, but even I sometimes find myself in seasons where I'm not just engaged in the scripture relationally. Not for preparation, just for me, where I just open the text and just read it and question and pray and let the scriptures speak to me. And I don't want us to be embarrassed. I want us to say, you know what, I don't know enough about that. In fact, I have underestimated its importance in my life and I've underestimated what it can do to make my life better and to make me better at my life. And I think I'm going to re-engage and I'm not going to act like I know a lot about it. I'm not going to try to impress anybody about it. And it may be only five minutes a day, but I'm going to get back to the business of reading the Scripture. That's what I want to do everything in my power today to challenge you to do. And I want to do that because I think it's such a significant lens through which we look for God. Now, last week, if you weren't here, 
I don't do this very often, but I really want to encourage you to go back and listen to last week because it was kind of this giant umbrella macro introductory sermon series about these four lenses through which we look to find God. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Those four, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And those are generalized camps, but most churches, most communities of faith spend a lot of time in one of those camps. They're real heavy on traditions, maybe not so much in the scripture, not so much in the experience. Or maybe you grew up kind of in a Pentecostal version of faith, and it was all about the experiential nature of the Holy Spirit, but didn't maybe pay attention to the traditions at all. Or maybe you grew up in what we call a Bible church, and it was all about the scriptures, and they kind of ignored the traditions. And it was the Bible church, but you just read the words on the page, and you weren't allowed to bring your intellect to bear and say, wait a minute, I don't know about that. And so you didn't know you had permission to engage in the scripture. And so last week, what we said was there are four lenses. And along comes this Anglican cleric in the 1700s that says, all four valid, all four are crazy important. And if you only look for God through one lens, what you find is ultimately blurry. And you need all four of those lenses in partnership. And last week we talked about intention. You need those lenses stacked on top of each other. And then when you layer all four of those lenses together, wow, your understanding and what you see and know about God becomes really, really clear. And it's natural for you to lean into one or the other. You'll say, Paul, we want more of three and four and not so much of two and a little bit of one. And it's natural to have that little dance in there. And Wesley said, that's okay. It's a tension. But, and here's the but, and this is why we're starting this week with talking about Scripture. Wesley said all four lenses matter, all four are valid, but one of them is stronger than the other three lenses. And the strongest of the four is Scripture. Wesley said this, The Scripture, therefore, of the Old and New Testament is a most solid and precious system of divine truth. If you want to find God, if you want to look for God, the clearest lens through which to look for God is the lens of the Bible. To pick it up and to read it. And I know you say, well, Paul, we come every week and we want you to talk to us about it for 27 minutes and get us all fired up about it and make it relevant. And what Wesley would say is, that's fine, but the real clarity comes from you and me sitting down, picking it up, and reading it. And Wesley was fanatical about this. He wrote this one day in his journal, oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unius libri, which means a man of one book. That's what they called John Wesley, a man of one book. John Wesley, if you're here today, would tell you that the Bible includes on its pages everything that you and I would ever need for salvation. It is the clearest lens through which we look for God. But sometimes we kind of dismiss it and we lean more heavily into the other three. We're great with the traditions and we want to come and do communion and we want to say the Lord's Prayer every week. And we want to think about God with our reason. And we pray to God experientially. But you still wander around in a fog and it doesn't seem like God is very clear. Wesley would say, well, maybe you haven't engaged the strongest, most powerful lens. And the cool thing is, it's a great read. And I say this all the time and I try to really make it Compelling for you, but the Bible is full of all kinds of stuff like murder, (laughs) intrigue, armies, kings, queens, a whole bunch of affairs, a lot of stuff about true love, villains, good guys, bad guys, rich, poor. I'm telling you, anything you would find and keep it up with the Kardashians, (laughs) right? You got in here already. It's all there. It is an awesome, awesome read. Any theme in your life that you've ever struggled with, it's there. And so Wesley says this is so important. Before Wesley, a lot of theologians have thought this, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to his buddy Timothy, and he talked about how important Scripture is. And in 2 Timothy 3, he said this, All Scripture is God-breathed. I love that phrase, is God-breathed, is divinely inspired, that God had an influence in the writing of Scripture. There's a divine influence in the writing of Scripture. It is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the Spirit of God not only once inspired those who wrote the Scriptures, 
But the Holy Spirit continually inspires us, supernaturally assists us, if you will. And I know that sounds a little off-putting to some of you that may be new to the faith. But somehow we think that even supernaturally, just by reading of the Scripture, it gives us a clear vision of God. And what that means in street terms on Monday morning is when you read it, you're better at life and your life is better. You read the scripture, it impacts the way that you think. It impacts the way that you live. When we read scripture, we are different in every category. When you read scripture, the way you deal with finances, way different than the rest of the world. When you read scripture and try to practice it, the way that you deal with dating, way different. The way that you deal with marriage, totally different. The way that you raise your kids, different the way that you deal with people that hate you and that are mean to you, different. The way that you handle adversity, the way that you are scared or not scared of death, all influenced by the words in the Bible. Now, I'm like you, I promise. I'm like you. There are things in the Bible when I read, I don't like them. And I don't want to read, I don't know what that means, and I don't want it. There are things that sometimes I think, oh, I don't know if that's, it doesn't seem believable, but it's the scripture. And I, there are things that challenge me. There are things that make me uncomfortable, but I'm telling you, the more I read it, the more I understand God. It is the strongest lens we have. And so if you're here today and you think, I want to know God, what do I do? I've been coming to church and I've been giving and volunteering I just want to pose the question, are you using the strongest lens that we have? And here's something else I know. Regardless of whether you read it or not, if you never read the Bible, guess what? You're shaped by what's in the Bible daily. Whenever you feel guilty about God and guilty about life and guilty and guilty and guilty and your life is just racked with guilt, guess what? That's because somebody was informed by Scripture and it shaped some counsel that they gave you. And in those moments when you're totally okay with God and you love God and you believe in grace and that God loves you and forgives you no matter what you have done and who you are and what decisions you made, guess where that comes from? Scripture. So everything that makes us feel guilty and everything that makes us feel good about God, we are shaped by Scripture whether we read it or not. The understanding of your conscience, the way you differentiate right from wrong. Guess what? We're not born with that. That's molded and shaped and largely by Scripture. And so what I'm contending is if that's the case and you're going to be impacted significantly by this text, don't you owe it to yourself to read it? Just to pick it up and just to start plowing through the pages, and I know there's so many different ex excuses, right? It's hard. But I tried it, Paul. It was hard. Come on. It's not hard, right? <laughs> What's hard is recovering from bad decisions that you made without being informed by maybe another way of making those same decisions. What's hard is raising your kids without it and then panicking and thinking, gee, I wish I could go back and do that over again. That's hard. What's hard is destroying your marriage because the only thing you have to talk about is debt and how you're going to pay the next visa bill. And you never paid attention to what the scripture revealed about how God feels about money and about finances. And the beautiful thing is it's more accessible than ever. We have it online. We have copies that you can just take. We have them in the pews in our sanctuary, and sometimes they walk, and we have staff members that get all worked up. Somebody stole the scriptures. I'm like, good. <laughs> awesome. Put more out, you know. How bad can it be? You know, so it's like, there's a million reading plans. If you want to just read about the women in the Bible, there's a reading plan just for you. If you just want to read the New Testament, there's a reading plan for you. If you just want to read about the villains, there is a reading plan for you. If you like the Old Testament, if you want to read it chronologically, there are any number of thousands of reading plans. You can get them on your phone. You can tailor it to your own personality and to your own needs. We have more access than ever. And this is what is so perplexing to me as a pastor. Do you know that there are governments that are terrified that their people will start reading the Bible. 
And we don't have to worry about that. You go to a lot of countries today, and it's illegal to have one of these. If you bring one in, you got to bring it out. You certainly can't leave it. You can't give one to anybody. And we have access to it. I want to encourage you to read it. And to kind of eliminate the excuses. And it can be five minutes a day. I mean, I really mean that. Five, five minutes, five minutes. I'm just going to pick it up. I'm just going to start reading it. Just, let, just start reading it. And if you say, Paul, I can't start at the beginning. Fine, call us up. Email us. We'll get you on a reading plan. We'll help you find one that you can handle. Just start reading it. Reintroduce yourself. Don't be embarrassed and say, I've gone to church for 30 years and I really know nothing about the Bible and I can't tell anybody that. Yes, you can. You're ignoring the clearest lens that we have to see God. And it matters. I want to share with you briefly a scripture uh, from the Old Testament, and it's kind of in the middle of the Bible. It comes from what we call the book of Psalms. Psalms are 150. It's a collection of 150 poems and hymns and songs, and it's kind of in the middle of your Bible. If you just open it up, you'll find the Psalms, and I always say it like this. The Bible is 66 books, 65 of which are God's words to us. One of those books are actually our words back to God. These are folks that sat around and thought, I'm going to tell God how I feel. And sometimes they're happy and they're celebrating God, and sometimes they're mad, and sometimes they are cursing at God, and sometimes they are begging God to help them understand. And I love the Psalms because they're very human. And in the 119th Psalm, you find a guy named King David, and David is kind of pontificating. He's talking about what Scripture has meant to him. And I think it's kind of cool because he's the king, he's real busy, and yet he's found time to engage in Scripture. I also think it's cool because when David wrote this, he only had access to seven of the books. We now have 66, right? But when David was around, there weren't all the other books of the Bible. He just had the first seven to engage. And even with that limited amount, he was so moved and impacted by Scripture, and this is what he wrote. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. By law, he's talking about the first seven books, the scripture. I love it. I meditate. I think about it all day long. Now, these are writings, by the way, that were written hundreds of years before David was even born. So for those of you that think, I don't want to read the Bible because it's old, it's out of date. Hundreds of years before David was even born, these documents were written. And David found value in them, and he says, I actually think about this stuff all day long. They weigh in on all my decision-making. They inform me. They influence me. In the different portions of my day when I'm struggling or celebrating, somehow, because of my reading of Scripture, I've allowed it to weave itself into the way that I think. And I read that one line of Scripture. I meditate it on all day long, and I think about, what do I think about all day long when I'm going through my life? I tend to think about how will it affect the bottom line? Will it make me late? What will I have to miss? What sacrifice am I having to make to do this? How hard is it going to be? And I read this about the king of Israel thinking, no, 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 no. I have allowed myself to be influenced. I think about this stuff all day. When I go to make a big, hard decision at work, I actually reflect on something that I read in Scripture. That's what David is saying. He goes on, your commands are always with me, and they make me wiser than my enemies. Wouldn't you love just to be smarter than the bad guys in your life? And it's not necessarily guys or people even. We have a lot of enemies, temptation, illness, tragedy, shortcomings, mistakes, failures, worries, fear. We have a lot of enemies. Wouldn't you love to be one step ahead and to be smarter? David says, so, you know how I get ahead of my enemies? Scripture makes me a little bit better at doing my life. And so I reflect on it all day long, and it turns out, as I read it, it makes me smarter than everything that's trying to set me back. Everything in my life that's trying to bring me down, Scripture makes me smarter than. He goes on, verse 99, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders for I obey your precepts. I've got mentors and leaders and teachers, and guess what? The smartest thing in the room is a book. In other words, I'm wise beyond my years. I talk to older people. I love older people. They're so valuable with all their wisdom. 
But none of them that I have met yet are smarter, according to David, than the wisdom that leaps off the pages when I read scriptures. It gives him insight. David says it gives me insight. We all want insight. One of the challenges with the Bible, though, is sometimes we want insight before we obey. Explain to me why I need to obey, and then I will obey. But it's like your mom yanking you off the street corner before the car runs you over. Sometimes you just have to obey, and then the insight comes. And David says that's the way it works with Scripture. He says, I get a lot of insight that's smarter than my mentors just by reading. He goes on in 101, I've kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws. And I love this. You should circle this. For you yourself have taught me. Now, this is David. Again, these are our words to God. This is David writing a letter to God. And he says this, for you yourself have taught me. In other words, God, when I read your scripture, it is like the Lord of the universe teaching me personally. No classroom, just one-on-one. And if you know people that read the Bible a lot, they will all tell you this happens. They're like, Paul, I read the scriptures a lot, and I'm telling you, it is amazing. It is like God is talking directly to me. That's what David was trying to say about 3,000 years ago. There's something that goes on where we feel a more personal relationship with God. Almighty, infinite God that we can never possibly even fathom or understand. David says, when I read scripture, it is like that God is actually in the room teaching me himself. That's pretty cool. How many times do we try to get God to do things? And David says, there are times when God just wants to say things. And see, I've inventoried my prayer life sometimes, and I realize that it's all about begging God to do stuff. God, I need you to start this. I need you to stop this, prevent this, provision for this, do that. Sometimes God doesn't mind the doing, but it occurs to me through David, sometimes God doesn't want to do things for you. God just wants to say things to you. And according to David, there's no better way to hear God, to see God, than to read Scripture. What if the primary tool that you and I had for hearing what God had to say to us, the most effective access point that you and I had to know God, was found on the pages in this book? David says, I've been reading it, and I think that it is. Verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Law is shaped. My values, what's right and what's wrong. And then there's this kind of famous line, and even if you don't go to church, you probably know this line. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light unto my path. Now this is written hundreds of years before David was born. And I read that about the lamp under the feet and this great imagery conjured up about a dark alley and a light that provides some measure of comfort and safety. And I think these texts were written hundreds of years before David, yet he somehow thinks it's applicable to my feet right here, right now. This is personal. A light for my path. This isn't general theory. This is a light for the moment that I'm in. I'm dealing with a death. I'm dealing with a cancer. I'm dealing with a failure. I don't have a job. I'm over my head in debt. This is a light for my path. This is personal. This is not big theology only for preachers or people that went to seminary. The best I can tell from reading scripture, David never even went to school. All right, he just started as a shepherd, and he did something heroic, and woo, we got elevated pretty quickly. This isn't for theologians of deep thought. This is just a guy who's so desperate for God, and he says, all I know is all I know, but I'm telling you, when I read this, it helps. Something happens, and so I'm going to keep reading it. I'm going to keep reading it through the excuses. I'm going to keep reading it when I don't understand it. I'm going to keep reading it when I try to fall asleep. I'm going to keep reading it when it's boring. I'm going to keep reading it because something happens profound in my life. And I think David's right. And it's okay to say I'm not smart enough. Just read it. 
It's okay to say I kind of pretended like I knew it, but really I couldn't find Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. I don't even know where those are. It's relax. Just read it. It's alive. And it will come alive in your heart the more you read it. And it's not like a book. We always call it a book. It's not a book. This is not a book. This is a library. This is a walk-in library of 66 different books, manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, written, by the way, by 40 different authors over the course of about 1,500 years. That, to me, is awesome. Everybody says, you know, every religion has a book, and every religion has a guy that wrote a book, and it's almost always a guy. Because, in fact, the book says that women ought to just kind of keep quiet. I don't know what to do about that. We're going to talk about that next week. It's not a book. It's 66 books written over 1,500 years. It's not like a bunch of dudes got in a room and said, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Let's dupe all the people. And you cover this part about the Israelites, and then you get this part, and then I'll bring it on home with this thing about the resurrection. It happened over 1,500 years with writers that did not know each other and had never met. And they just tell what's happened and what is happening in the moment. And through that, a divine revelation about who God is and what's important to God surfaces. This overarching giant epic story of, Na of, of Israel uh, born out of this People, you know, Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve, you only got one rule. How many rules? One rule, that's it, one rule. What's the rule? Don't pretend to be God. I'm God, you're not, don't be God. That's the only rule. Otherwise, have at it. And they break the rule. And we can improve upon God. That's what they say. And they try to, and then all chaos breaks loose. The world is broken. And sin enters in the world. And you have all those questions about God. It's the same questions I have. Why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? And why do sometimes good things happen to bad people? Read Genesis 3. Don't try to be God. They try to be God. And the world's broken. And the rest of the, the, rest of the Bible, the remaining 65 books, God trying to redeem us and bring things back together. There's a lot of nuance in there, right? He empowers this guy named Abraham at 70 years old, which I think is pretty cool. Some of you just read the Bible, and you might discover at 70 that your best years are actually still ahead of you. That's something that you might learn. He says, Abraham, you're going to have a child. You're going to be a blessing, and I'm going to bless you to bless others. And you're going to show the world through this nation. They're like, we don't even know what nations are. Okay? It's like this community except bigger. And the way that you show the world is going to reveal to the world what God is like. And so off they go. And brokenness comes in again. And what we discover in our Bible and what I hope that you will discover, it's, it's not just a story about other people. It's a story about us. That God, launching through Abraham, just establishes a covenant with his people. And he says, you're going to be my people. And they say, yay, we're glad to be your people. We want to be your people. And then in a short amount of time, they get bored with being the people. And so they start chasing after other gods and other priorities. And then God allows for all kinds of things to happen. And other nations come in and invade and conquer. And they start practicing crazy things. And their lives are in shambles. And they practice injustice. And they fall away from God. And then they start really hurting, and then they cry out to God, and God is always right there to come back. He says, oh, you do need me, okay. And then they love God again for a little while. And then they veer off course again. And God withdraws his protection, and they cry out, and God delivers them, and on and on it goes. And what I hope is that you'll see is it's not a story about Abraham and Moses and David and Joshua. It's a story about you. That we all want to know God, and we all fall away from God, and we know how to live right, and we fall away from living right, and then we cry out, and we're hurting, and then God, through his mercy, forgives us and redeems us and delivers us, and then we do it again. And the story's timeless and it is universal. And then you get to the New Testament and there's a story about a king who will come on behalf of God and it begins with the birth of that king. 
And then there are these four documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these kind of theological biographies. They don't cover everything about the life, but it's a concentrated look at the life of Jesus up until the time he's about 33 years old. And then after that, we have about 27 documents, texts or letters, that follow up on people that are trying to live like Christ because they witnessed or heard about or knew about this thing called the resurrection. And they have all these problems and all these complications, and they're local churches, and so they write to the authorities and say, we don't understand this about Christianity. We got a lot of questions. And so guys like Paul and James and John and Peter will write them letters back and say, we've heard your questions. Here are some answers. This is what we think faith looks like. And we believe that is God breathed. It's universal and it's timeless. And the whole thing wraps up with this kind of prophetic book, this kind of criticism of society about the Roman Empire. And it talks about the Roman Empire being tempted to succumb to culture. And John, through the book of Revelation, says, don't do that because one day everything that you think is important and everything culturally that you value, it's all going to go by the wayside. It's all going to be destroyed. And so be alert because this is what God looks like. And one day every tear will be wiped away. Now, how awesome is that? And it's not a story about other people. It's a story about you, and it's a story about me. And so I want for you what I think David wanted for his people. And I want for you what I'm pretty convinced John Wesley wanted for modern-day Protestants in the 1700s. To recognize that we've been gifted the clearest lens with which to see God. It is not the only lens. We're going to talk about that but it is the clearest lens that we have. And underneath these pages of Scripture, there is something divine. There is something holy. And when we read it, something happens. The words give life. And they shape us. And they pierce our souls. And they impact us. And they influence. Don't you owe it to yourself to read it. So for anybody out there that has been struggling to know God and you just find God a big giant blur, I want to encourage you to get back to a pattern of reading your Bible. Not as punishment. If you don't ever touch another page of the Bible, guess what? It's not like God is going to punish you. But if you want to fully know what God is like, we've been blessed with a gift called Holy Scripture. Now, if you're here today and you still think, I have some questions, my brain is going crazy because I can't just read it and not ask questions, and where are the dinosaurs, right? And what is the deal with women in the church, and why does God seem to be so... Breathe. Come back next week, and we're going to deal with reason and the gift of bringing your brain to bear in tension with everything that I just told you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of Scripture, how lucky we are. We take it for granted. We think it's important, but ultimately there are so many of us that if we're really honest, we tend to ignore it. Help us not to do that. Help us to dig deep and to overcome the excuses and to allow you to speak to us about who you are, what you look like, how you act, what you think, what's important to you by picking up these Scriptures and reading them. In your Son's holy name we pray. Amen.